The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. The word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. It is our blessing this morning to study the word of God, and we are going through a topical study called Major Bible Themes. It is based upon a book written by Lewis Berry Chafer and later revised by John Walverd. We are studying the scriptures through a topical study which is directed by this. Now, if you do not have the most recent notes, we did publish some new notes last week. So if you don't have the most recent notes, they are in the, in the back. And actually, Molly is, is uh, handing some of those out. So if you, if you do not have the most recent notes that were published last week, raise your hand and she'll get you a copy of that. She'll get you a copy of that. Now, there's additional pages yet to come, and I've been hard at work on this study, and I'm still not finished with the notes on this, Uh, but there will be additional pages yet to come that will be added on to what you already have. This is a uh, somewhat long study to go through all the dispensations and the ages, but it's a blessing to be able to do that. Before we begin our study this hour, let's make sure that we are in the right place spiritually in order to be able to learn the things of the Word of God. It's a spiritual undertaking, and we have to be spiritual, so... We need to confess sins if necessary. If we're out of fellowship, we need to confess sins and get back in fellowship. But also we need to humble ourselves under the ministry of the Holy Spirit and ask God in our prayers to lead us into the truth that He would have us to learn from the study of His Word this hour. So let's take a moment for silent prayer. We can lift up all those prayers. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, we are undeserving in any way that you should bless us with an opportunity to spend more time in your word, and yet you have graciously done so today. You gave us a new day by waking us up this morning. Your mercies are renewed day by day. We have one more day, at least we know we have today, to be able to spend time walking with you, fellowshipping with you, glorifying you with our lives, and as we spend time studying your word, it equips us. It gives us what we need in order to be able to understand you more, have a more intimate relationship with you, and to be able to know what you expect of us and live our lives accordingly, Father. So we ask that you would lead us into that truth this hour, that you would strengthen us in our faith, and that you would give us the strength to be able to make decisions on a day-by-day basis according to the things we've learned from your word And by doing so, we will in fact be ambassadors for Christ in this lost and dying world, that we will image Him to those around us and show them Jesus Christ. Because, Father, we know the truth that the only way to have a reconciled relationship with You is through Your Son, Jesus Christ. There are those who say there's many paths to heaven, but there there are not. Jesus Christ Himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes unto the Father, but by me. It is only by faith in Jesus Christ that we can be reconciled to you, Father. And I thank you for that, and I thank you that you've given us opportunities to image him in our lives by being obedient to your word. So help us to be those good and faithful servants, Father. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's most precious and holy name. Amen. Well, We are studying in the major Bible things, but I actually have a little bit of a follow-up, a little bit of a follow-up to my exhortation from last Sunday morning, and it's twofold. It's twofold in nature, because I did have some feedback uh, from the exhortation from last Sunday. Most of it was positive, uh, and I thank God for that. I don't take any credit for that. I thank God for that. Uh, But the exhortation, as you know, was to, uh, well, there there was a lot involved in it. If you weren't here last Sunday, then the lesson is up on, the, up on the, the website, and you can go to it and listen to it or look at the screencast. But the exhortation had to do with uh, growth in the Word and how it's a gradual process and how that we, each and every one of us, need to grow. And we also need to recognize that as we look across the dining room table 
at the other members of our family. They need to grow as well. We need to grow. They need to grow. And we need to have the grace to be able to allow them to grow up in their faith. And we need to not knock them down. We need to not be critical. We need to not try to force them to grow at the pace that we want them to grow. But instead, we need to encourage them to grow at the pace God is growing them. He is the one who will cause the growth to happen in any individual's life. And if you try to force it on somebody, all that's going to do is turn them off. Turn them against you, in fact. So you need to not do that. One of the things I talk about is encouraging, encouraging people around you to grow in their faith. Well, one of the things I needed to clear up on that to make sure we're clear on is that you do not want to use encouragement to be an enabler. What do I mean by that? If somebody is walking in a manner that glorifies God, if they're walking in a manner that is Christ-like, then we want to encourage them in that. If they're not... We want to encourage them to walk in a Christ-like manner. But what we don't want to do is encourage bad behavior. There's plenty of people who are so of the mindset of always encouraging people that even when somebody is misbehaving, they still try to encourage them. That's not what we're supposed to do. You're not supposed to say, oh, well, it's okay. You're wonderful anyway, even though you just stole that thing from the grocery store. Uh, No, no. That's not the right thing to do. There are times where the appropriate thing is a rebuke. But let me ask anybody in here a question. Is a rebuke as unto the Lord harsh? Is it? Do we ever find ourselves in a situation, do we ever find ourselves in a situation where we might start throwing tables in the temple as Christ did? Perhaps we will. So the answer to the question is there may be a situation where throwing tables in the temple, quote unquote, throwing tables in the temple is what's required, but I can promise you most of the time it's not. 99% of the time, that's not how Jesus handled it, right? Did he go around throwing tables all the time during his ministry? No. That's a unique event, isn't it? Where he went and threw the temple tables around because they were turning the temple into a place of business. Most of the time, he handled his rebukes very gently, very lovingly, and that's how we should be as well, all right? So when you encourage somebody, when I say encourage somebody, you should encourage them, and what I mean by that, what I meant when I said that last week is that, for example, you might say something like, hey, let's go ahead and, it's starting to get a little late, let's go ahead and sit down and do the Bible reading for today. That's what I mean by encourage somebody to grow, or We just got done with the Bible reading. Uh, Do you have any questions you want to talk about it? This is what I mean by encouraging somebody to grow. You do things that help them to follow along in the path that you know God has for them. Or a situation arises and you might encourage somebody by saying, oh, remember when we were reading in Job the other day and Job said... This is what I'm talking about. That's, that's bringing up a, a scripture that you've been reading, bringing up something you've been studying and using it for application. So you're showing the other person how to apply that verse to a particular situation in their lives. That's encouraging them to grow. But if they're behaving badly, you don't want to encourage that. But if they're behaving badly, do you want to cut them to the ground? Do you want to be mean to them? Do you want to be ugly? No, because that's just going to upset them. That's not going to help them to grow. But a rebuke done in love might be necessary. So that's number one. Encouragement is done in the way of showing somebody, leading somebody in the direction of doing the things that will help them grow. But sometimes a rebuke is going to be necessary, but it's almost always going to be a gentle rebuke. Almost always. If you find that your rebukes are not gentle, if your rebukes are harsh, then you need to pray about it before you give a rebuke. You need to give a rebuke in love. It's always going to be done in love. Second thing. Second thing. If you walked out of here last Sunday and you thought I was talking to somebody else, let me correct that right now. (laughs) Let me correct that right now. If you walked out of here and thought, boy, I hope so-and-so was listening. Uh, No. I was talking to each and every one of you. The The Lord was working through me. The Holy Spirit was talking through me and was talking to your soul. As I look around the room, He was talking to your soul. Now, there's two things that can come out of that. This is what I want to emphasize. There are two things that can come out of that. You know how we talk about before communion, we always talk about how you need to examine your own souls, right? We must examine ourselves, okay? 
When you hear something like that, when an exhortation is given from the pulpit, and that's not me doing it, that's God the Holy Spirit doing it. When God delivers an exhortation like that, you can examine your own soul. And I'm talking about an honest examination. I'm not talking about where you just hear the message and go, well, I'm fine. I'm fine. But so-and-so over there, see, that's, that's not an examination of the soul. What I'm talking about is you, you prayerfully consider your own spiritual walk. And if you find that your walk lines up with the things that God would have you to do, then you're done with the examination and that, that exhortation has now confirmed to you that you're walking the way you're supposed to. But it's got to be an honest, honest examination. In other words, make sure you can see the log in your own eye. Right? It's so easy to see the splinter in somebody else's eye, but do you notice the log in yours? I promise you, everybody in this room that heard that exhortation, including me, was being spoken to. And if we're honestly examining ourselves and we look at part of our lives, then we will be corrected by God's Word. His Word corrects us, right? It adjusts our thinking. We are being transformed by the renewing of our mind. And I promise you, if you're honest and you accepted that exhortation in humility, then something in your own life was changed if you truly accepted it. Here's the thing. If somebody walks up to me and they're talking about a situation... And they say to themselves, well, if so-and-so would only do blah, 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 then blah, 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 everything would be better, blah, blah, blah. That's, I don't even want to hear that. I don't even want to hear that. Because let me give you an example. I can tell you, how can, how can my marriage be better with Terry? How can my marriage be better with Terry? And if I start talking about that and I say, well, if Terry would just, if Terry would just, if Terry would just, I'm carnal. I'm not even in the right state of mind. I'm not even coming from the right perspective. The perspective is, you know what, how my marriage could be better? If... When I'm out doing my studies and I'm out there for hours and hours, if I just took a break somewhere in and I just came in and I spent 15 minutes with her and we just spent some time together, or if maybe when something was happening, you know, we pray about things individually, but if some things were happening and I went in and I spent some time with her and we prayed together over certain things, and I should go through a list. If I'm being honest with you and I'm in the right frame of mind of humility, then when I go through that list, it's all about what I can do. Well, what about Terry? Aren't there some things that she could do? Well, probably so, but you know what? That's what's going to be in her thinking. That's going to be in her list, not mine. If your orientation is what other people need to do to correct their spiritual walk, then you need to adjust it. Your thinking is wrong. You need to be focused on your own spiritual walk, and you need to be helping others to grow in their spiritual walk, doing anything you can to help them to grow. But as far as the corrections go, only God can speak to their soul. Only God can correct them. If you're trying to do it, stop right now. You're not going to be able to do it. And I promise you the worst situation is being between husbands and wives. Because the moment you start trying to correct your spouse, <laughs> that's not going to go real well. We all know that. We've got a, a couple here that has been married for over 50 years. We celebrated their 50th anniversary with a renewal of the vows. I promise you they can teach us all about what I'm talking about. They're back there nodding their heads. <laughs> They know exactly what I'm talking about. You can encourage your spouse to grow, but you need to be focused on what you need to change in your own walk. That God is working on you and delivering messages to you, not only from the pulpit, but from your Bible reading that you're doing, or when you allow the Word to dwell richly within your soul as you meditate on God's Word. You're going to find, if you're honest with yourself, that there's arrows and knives and all kinds of things coming in to convict the question is, are you going to respond to that? Are you going to respond to it, or are you going to continue to just blame somebody else for your own unhappiness? Are you going to blame somebody else for the fact that your walk is not working? That's what I wanted. The two things I wanted to point out is that make sure that your encouragement is done in the right direction. Don't encourage bad behavior. And number two, the message was for you. Dwell on it. Chew on it. If you don't remember what it was, go back and listen to it off of the Internet. Because a lot of people responded to that. Obviously, the God, the Holy Spirit, was delivering a message to this flock. And that message is either going to confirm that you're doing the right thing or correct you and point out that you were doing the wrong thing. And only your own examination of your own soul is going to tell you which one it was. All right, so that's my follow-up to last Sunday's exhortation. Back to our study. We were looking at the dispensation of Israel... Let me back up for those who are joining us today. We're studying the dispensation in ages. I'm going to actually back up here real quickly. 
the dispensations and the ages. See if I can get there in your notes. Different dispensations. Dispensations are, is a fancy word that I use that really describes a stewardship. A stewardship. And what that means is certain people have been put into a position of responsibility, accountability. They are God's representatives, if you will, on earth. They are God's representatives on earth. Well, I believe there was a stewardship of the angels. We may, that may be one of the things where we disagree, a jot or a tittle, but I believe before that man was given stewardship responsibilities, that the angels actually had a stewardship on earth. After that was completed, then we have the stewardship of man. All of mankind, for a period of history, all of mankind was actually the representatives for God here on earth. All of mankind. And that lasted right up until we had the call of Abraham. The call of Abraham and then subsequently Isaac and Jacob. The calling out of the Jewish people, they were set aside as God's chosen people. You've heard that term described before. God's chosen people. And they were now His stewards on the earth. They were the stewards of the oracles of God. They were the ones who were supposed to be um, worshiping as unto the Lord and spreading the message to those in the Gentile nations. They certainly shirked that responsibility, but they were supposed to be His stewards on earth. Then, after the dispensation of Israel, the stewardship of Israel had progressed along for a period of time, they were put on the back burner. And the reason I say the back burner is that they still yet have future stewardship responsibilities. But they were put on the back burner, and what has taken place now is a mystery, which is something that had never been understood in the Old Testament Scriptures. A mystery is taking place today. There's a body of individuals who are called out from among, from among the Jews and the Gentiles, called out based upon their faith in Jesus Christ. All of those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ now become part of the body of Christ or something known as the church. I always mark it with a capital C, the church, universal. Everybody who is a, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is part of a body of believers that make up the church. And that actually includes the ones who have already passed away as well as all the ones that exist on the earth today. The stewards are the ones that are on the earth today. The ones who have already gone to glory, those are no, they are no longer stewards. Uh, they're no longer having stewardship responsibilities. But one, the ones who are alive on the earth today have a stewardship responsibility. And then what's going to happen is that in the future, when that glorious day comes and our Lord Jesus Christ descends with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, there will be the rapture of the church. And for the first time in all of human history, I'm kind of giving you a little heads up here, first time in all of history, the church will be gathered together as one. All the believers of the church will be gathered together as one. And we will go up into glory and receive our resurrection bodies. At that point in time, the stewardship responsibilities will return back to the people of Israel. They will once again be the stewards on earth. And they'll be stewards for two more ages that we're going to talk about. And then after that, we have the stewardship of Christ. That stewardship is in the fullness of the times on the new heavens and the new earth. Some of you may not know this, but there is going to be, there will be global warming of an enormous scale. <laughs> there will come a day when God himself will destroy the heavens and the earth. All that you see in this universe, all that we know of this physical universe will be destroyed by fire. It's going to all be gone. And then God will create a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And on that new heavens and that new earth in which righteousness dwells, that's where you will have the stewardship of Christ himself. He will no longer simply be the king of Israel sitting on the throne of David. He will also be king over all the peoples of the earth. That's the stewardship of Christ. That day is yet coming. Why do I tell you all the way to the new heavens and the new earth? Because Peter told us, according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. In other words, our focus should not be on that going on right there or there or there or the things of here. We should be focused on what God's perfect plan is that in the omega, when we get to the omega of his plan, we're going from the alpha to the omega. When we get to the omega we will be on the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. That should be 
what we're looking for. That's what Peter told us. We should be looking for that. Now, we've gone through already and we've studied. We're not going to study, as that last point says, we're not going to study the stewardship of the angels. We're only focused on the, the dispensations in which man is given responsibilities. If we go through this, we've already done the dispensation of man. I'm actually going to skip through here. I'm going to skip quickly through. We already did the dispensation of man, and we've started looking at the dispensation of Israel. I think that's it. That's the one I wanted. Dispensation of Israel. This is all in your notes. All right, it's broken out into five ages. The difference between a dispensation and an age is as follows. A dispensation is a stewardship. It's, the, it's a group of individuals or all of mankind in some of those stewardships, but a group of individuals that are the, the responsible ones, the responsible parties, the God's representatives on earth. An age is within a dispensation. It's a set of circumstances and conditions. That's why this is important to understand. So for Israel, the chosen people of God, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the 12 tribes, there, have been, there are five ages outlined in the Scriptures. The first age is the age of promise, when the covenant promises were given to Israel. And that's what we're studying right now. The second age, which we'll get to, is the age of law. When law is handed down, it begins with the giving of the Ten Commandments giving of the Ten Commandments, and then subsequently additional ordinances and instructions are given. And you have in all in all 613, 613 things that are handed down that are part of the Jewish law, if you will. Why do I know it's 613? Because when Tebow passed for 316 yards uh, and everybody was talking about John 316, the Jewish people said, yeah, but we read it from right to left. It's actually 613. And that's, the, and that's how many points of law are given. So anyway, all that's kind of funny, I think. But anyway, so the age of law, that's when law is given to the people of Israel. And then what happens, then what happens is they live under law, and then the age of the incarnation. Now, the law is still in act. The law is still in effect, right, when Jesus comes. But the circumstances and conditions have changed pretty significantly when Jesus himself comes. The Messiah arrives on the earth those three ages are in the past those three ages are in the past but the age of tribulation and the age of millennial reign are yet future they have not occurred yet tribulation will happen it will be seven years Daniel's 70th week or Jacob's distress and then after that you'll have the second advent of Jesus Christ he will return to the earth because remember in the rapture he does not come to the earth we meet him in the air so he does not come all the way to the earth. He, go, he comes and we meet him and we go up with him from there. But at the second advent, he's going to come all the way to the earth, split a mountain wide open, right? There's going to be, it's going to be a pretty dramatic entrance. He's going to come to the earth and he is going to set up his kingdom and he's going to reign for a thousand years. Very important to understand. So those are the ages of Israel and we've been looking at this. And this is all what we're talking about here with the Jewish people. Now recognize... During this dispensation, during this stewardship of the Jewish people, the people themselves are defined by earthly lineage. They're descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're one of the 12 tribes, okay? It's the Jewish people. Now, what that means, the significance of that, and we'll talk about this as we go through this, is that if you're a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you're part of the Jewish people regardless of whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. You may be an unbeliever. You may, not even, you may not even believe in God. But if you're a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you are part of the Jewish people as defined by their earthly lineage. Now, the true Jews, Paul pointed out the ones that are the true Jews are the ones that are the believers. But nonetheless, all of them are his stewards. All of them are his stewards in this particular dispensation. The Jewish people are chosen by God. And they're, again, believers and unbelievers, I just pointed that out. And then we have the age of promise. That's what we're working on right now. The age of promise that begins with the covenant God makes with Abraham. I'll go over this very quickly. It uh, promises blessings to the entire earth. That's in Genesis chapter 12. Uh, The covenant was only partially fulfilled in Abraham's lifetime. However, the effect of the covenant extends throughout human history. Because in Genesis chapter 12, when we learn that those who bless Israel will be blessed... And God will curse those who curse Israel. That's still in effect today. It's very important how we treat the people of Israel. And the fulfillment, the fulfillment of 
those covenants will ultimately be fulfilled at the second advent of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now recognize, recognize that there's two ways. It's an interesting thing. There's two ways. and this, this, I hope this is a comfort to you. There's two ways in which the American people might bless the people of Israel. Two ways. That, I mean, there, you might think of more, but there's two significant ways. One is how we deal with the current nation of Israel. Right? The gathering in unbelief is the way it's described in scriptures, but the gathering in unbelief of a nation of Israel that we have over there today. There will be a gathering in belief. We're going to learn about that in our eschatology study, about how God is going to gather the elect, which is actually all of the believing Jews. He's going to gather them together at his second advent. Now, right now they're gathered in unbelief, but we can bless the Jewish people by the way we, we interact with that nation of Israel. Secondarily, one of the, the primary ways we bless the people of Israel is the way that they can live in this nation in freedom. They have a place of safety, if you will, a place that they can live here. They're not under persecution, right? It's their refuge, their town of refuge, if you will, right? Remember how you learned about the town of refuge in the Old Testament? This is their country of refuge, if you will. So as long as the Jewish people are not under persecution and are being blessed by their their lives here in the United States of America. That's a second way. So even if, this is the reason I point this out, is even if you see us turning our, turning our political policies against the nation of Israel, that's disturbing enough, right? That is disturbing if you see that happen in this country. But even if that happens, just hold on to the fact that as long as the people of Israel are being blessed within this nation, then maybe God won't turn his back on us. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. I tell you what, I don't want to be part of either one of those, though. I don't want to be part of us turning our backs on Israel. I don't. But uh, hold on to the fact that it might be that as long as we're still blessing the people who live in this country, maybe God will continue to bless us. Uh, now, the covenant is, does not depend on human faithfulness, but only, but only upon the faithfulness of God. Now, how does that, why is that significant? Because when we get to another covenant that's made, the Mosaic covenant, that depends upon the faithfulness of the people, right? There's blessings promised for faithfulness. There's other things that are going to happen if you're unfaithful. The Mosaic covenant is a conditional covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is not. The Abrahamic covenant is unconditional, depends only upon the faithfulness of God. Keep that in mind. Abrahamic, unconditional. Mosaic, conditional. It's going to be important as we go forward. It's also declared to be an everlasting covenant. How long is everlasting? Everlasting, right? It's a stupid question to ask, but that covenant does not end. It's an everlasting covenant. All right, we also began to look at this. This is what we looked at last time. Uh, the overriding principles of human government and conscience still remain in effect. We looked at that when we were studying the dispensation of man about how the idea of there was a, an age of innocence that was in the garden. Then after the fall took place, which, by the way, I've preached this before. I'm, I have no, no problem with telling you I believe there was a literal garden and there was a literal Adam and Eve. I don't think this was just a cute little story to tell us. This was a true story. This was a truth about what happened. God placed Adam and Eve in the garden. He placed Adam and then he took Eve from Adam's rib. I think this is all reality, even though people laugh at us when we say that. Go ahead and laugh at me. I'm fine. You know, I don't care if, if mockers were going to laugh. But I, it all happened, that was innocence, and then the fall occurred, right? They, they took of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They, they did the one thing. God only had one thing that they weren't supposed to do, and they still failed. And so at that point, when the fall occurred, then you get into a new set of circumstances and conditions, and you get into the age of conscience. And then after conscience is the rule for years and years and years, you have the deluge, you have the flood, because what happened is people gradually became more and more evil. And when you get to the point of the flood, the Noahic flood, there was God had a hard time finding any righteousness on the earth. And so he flooded the whole earth and he wiped out all the creatures except for the ones that he spared in the ark. And again, I believe that's literal and true. I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's just some story. I think it's true. I believe with all my heart it's true that Noah and his family were on that ark with those animals. And then they came back down and they were, they were put onto the earth when it was finally okay for them to go on the earth. And then, and then at that point, God instituted two things that were new. One of them was that people could eat meat, which I'm very glad. I go to that verse a lot. See, it's okay. I can eat meat. 
But, uh, we, but up until that time, human beings were vegetarians. And then when you get to this point, they, were, they could eat of any of the plants. But then God, after the flood, said, it's okay, you can eat meat. And the second thing he instituted was human government. And it's very subtle. What he said is that if one man is killed, if somebody is murdered, in other words, then the murderer will be killed by people. In other words, human beings are going to carry out justice on the earth. That's human government. That's the first time because up until that time, God was the administrator of justice. And now he's handing over the responsibility of carrying out justice to humankind. And that's the institution of human government right there after the flood. Those are still in effect today, if you haven't noticed. We all still have a conscience. He's put that within us, and as long as we don't defile it, it's going to be a powerful thing in our lives, and we're all under human government. And in fact, after the whole Babel incident, right, the Tower of Babel incident, people were spread out throughout the earth and divided up into nations, individual nations. So we have not only human government, but the division of people up into people groups, if you will. All right, so that's all still in effect. But then this is where we stopped last time. And I hope that little review is helpful for you. Even if you've been coming to all the classes, hopefully that all brings it back into in the picture in just a little bit of a review. We saw two instances where Abraham showed a lack of faith. Right? He showed a lack of faith in terms of the, the land that had been promised to him. Their famine came to the land and he ran off. Choop, he went to Egypt. You know, he didn't even go to the Lord and pray and ask about it. A famine, well, I'm gone. And God told him to go there and to sojourn in that land and he didn't do it. He did it for a little while, but then as soon as the famine came, he left. And, it, and he failed in terms of trusting the promise of a child, right? We, have, uh, we talked about in the garden, we had uh, Operation Fig Leaf, right? After the fall, they tried, to solve their, they tried to solve their problem by sewing the fig leaves together. Well, then here with Abraham, we have Operation Handmaiden, right? They didn't have a child, and they decided for themselves that they weren't going to be able to have children. So they didn't trust in the promise of, of God, and so they said, all right, we've got a plan and a program, this will work. You know, Sarai said to Abram, why don't you take my handmaiden, why don't you take my servant here, Hagar. And uh, he went and, and slept with her, and they had a child, and uh, that was Ishmael. And so they tried to come up with their own plan. So he failed twice miserably in terms of his trust in God, in God's promise of the land and God's promise of the child. But look at this. Now we're going to look at a wonderful, a wonderful occurrence in Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 18. Turn with me there, Genesis 22, verses 1 through 18. And boy, Abraham shows faith that I don't think anybody among us would have. And this is another thing that's going to be really cool, by the way, about your Bible reading. As you go through and you read the Scriptures, what's going to happen is in class, we're going to start turning the passages and you're going to go, oh yeah, we just read that the other day, or I remember when we read that. It's going to start being more familiar to you. That's the really cool thing about this Bible reading that we're doing. But Genesis uh, 22, Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son. Now that's significant, by the way. I'm not going to preach for, for a whole month on that, but that is significant right there. Because didn't he have a son named Ishmael? But what did God say here? Your only son. What he's basically saying is this is your legitimate son. <laughs> he said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. And just like, just like it happened before when he asked him to leave his own land, he said, I'll leave and go to a land I will show you. And here he says, just, just go and take him uh, on, to one of the mountains which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he split wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. So in other words, God has now revealed to him where he's supposed to go. Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there to that place that he had seen, and we will worship and return to you. So he's saying to the young men that were with him, stay here, and, and, and Isaac and I will head over to this place. So then Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. So Isaac speaks to Abraham. Not a big shocker here. 
Abraham spoke to Abraham, his father, sorry about that, Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? This is a great question, right? We're walking along. I don't see an animal we're going to sacrifice here. What are we doing? And so Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. I believe that was said in faith. In other words, he was saying, look, God's told me to take my son up there and sacrifice him. And what's going to happen is here, God's going to be the one that's going to provide it. If, it, if it's going to be my son, it'll be my son. But if it's going to be another animal, it will be an animal, I mean, excuse me, an animal, then that will be provided for us. Uh, he, in faith, said God will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. So the two of them walked on together. And we learn later, by the way, in the New Testament, we learn that Abraham knew that even if God allowed him to kill his son, that somehow his son would be resurrected or something, that God would bring him back to life because this was the son of promise. And there was no way God was going to let the son of promise die. He knew that. He didn't understand it fully. And see, that's one of the problems we have in 21st century America is when God asks us to do something, we want to understand the whole thing. Give me all the parameters here, Lord. In fact, send me, a, send me a PDF which explains the whole thing, right? That's what we want. We want, the, we want details, but that God doesn't work that way a lot of times. He just says, go. He says, go do this, and then we just have to trust Him. We have to put our faith in what He's doing. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood, and, and I, I got to wonder what Isaac's thinking at this point, and he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now, I, don't, I assume that we don't have any dialogue here with Isaac, but I assume Isaac is maybe sitting there in silence thinking, maybe I'm the lamb, right? <laughs> maybe I'm the lamb, right? But he didn't say anything, at least it's not recorded. So Abraham then stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. This is an act of faith, faith that's more than any one of us would have. But there's faith on Isaac's part too, isn't there? There's faith on Abraham's side, there's faith on Isaac's side. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, because, let me back up a second, because Isaac could have struggled and he could have run away from his father. He could have you know, scurried off into the woods or down the mountain or whatever else, but Isaac didn't do that. Isaac obviously showed some faith in terms of being obedient to his father. Wonderful typology for our Savior, Jesus Christ. But the angel of the Lord, verse 11, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear, that's actually the word for respect as well, I know that you respect God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is, to the, is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. That means they're going to be able to have military victory is what that means. The, his seed shall, shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, singular, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And then it goes on from there. But we have this wonderful act of faith where Isaac was willing to take his son and sacrifice him on the altar. So even though Abraham failed in faith multiple times, he definitely passed the faith test when it comes to this. Isaac, however, followed after his father's failures when he ventured as close to Egypt as he could and lied about his wife. This is in Genesis 26. So turn forward, if you will, with me to Genesis 26. Now, see, we have another famine here, right? As this describes in Genesis 26. Now, there was a famine in the land besides the famine, the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So there's another famine in the land. So Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. The Lord appeared to him and said, don't, do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land of which I shall tell you. So he's saying, look, don't go down to Egypt. Don't do it. 
sojourn in, the land, in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. So here's the covenant being extended to Isaac. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and will give your descendants all these lands, and by your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac lived in Gerar. When the men of the place asked about his wife, he said, She is my sister. Now, where have we seen this before? (laughs) For he was afraid to say my wife, thinking the men of the place might kill me on account of Rebekah. So this is the exact same scenario. Sins of the father, right? Exact same scenario that Abraham did twice. He did it twice with Sarah. He says, look, they might kill me on account of Rebekah, for she is beautiful. It came about when he had been been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out through a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was caressing his wife, Rebekah. So clearly this scene was such that he could recognize this is, this is not between a brother and a sister, or this is weird. But uh, he figured out pretty quickly that this was not a brother and a sister. And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, certainly she is your wife. How then did you say she is my sister? And Isaac said to him, Because I said I might die on account of her. Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech charged all the people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Now Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man became rich and continued to grow richer until he became very wealthy. Now I think part of what's going on there is he finally fessed up. Now he was put on the spot is the only reason he actually fessed up but he finally fessed up to what he was doing and then here we see the blessings Uh, the man became very rich and continued to grow richer until he became very wealthy for he had possessions of flocks and herds and a great household so that the Philistines envied him now all the wells which were excuse me which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father The Philistines stopped them up by filling them with earth. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are too powerful for us. And Isaac departed from there and camped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. Now what what you don't know is that he was already in Gerar. He was already pretty close to Egypt. And now when he's told to leave, he actually inches a little closer still. And see, the whole thing is even though he's got all this wealth and things are going really well, he still is thinking about that famine thing. And he's thinking, Man, I, I need to be close to Egypt so I can... Baal to Egypt if it comes down to it. So it's kind of subtle in that story, but he actually kind of was obeying the command of the Lord, but only this much, right? He was getting as close to Egypt as he could get without actually being in Egypt. And we do that on our own lives too, don't we? Well, this isn't really a sin, but I'm not really obeying what God wants me to do, am I? So that's the thing that we're capable of doing as well. Jacob then went on to... uh, to fail to trust in the promises of God that had been given to his mother at birth and proved himself to be a schemer and a liar. I'm going to put these up here real quick, and we're actually going to come back to this. So we're going to see Abraham failed in faith, Isaac failed, Jacob fails, and yet God still blesses them all. I hope that's an encouragement to you that in spite of our own failures, God is providing us with blessings too, um, because what I deserve is the lake of fire. And he's not going to give that to me because of his beloved son and my faith in him. But, but these, we see these three, the three principal people here, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are all knuckleheads and they fail in their faith. And we also will read about, when we come back next time, we'll also read about the people of Israel continually grumbling and they show a lack of faith in, in God's provision for their escape and, and God's promise of victory and taking the promised land and so on. We're going to see their lack of faith as well. And yet, in, in the midst of all of that, God is gracious to them. But since we are getting on toward the time, I hesitate to continue on forward. Uh, unless you all want to go for a couple more minutes. You all ready to wrap it up? I can see people smiling. They're ready to wrap it up. <laughs> so we'll, we'll take a look at Jacob. We'll take a look at Jacob and his, uh, his failure to trust God's promises and the people of Israel and their grumbling. And it's going to be very convicting, I promise you. Because nobody raise your hand. How many of us grumble? All right, we've been blessed with blessings upon blessings upon blessings, with grace upon grace upon grace, 
And yet we still grumble. We're no different than the people of Israel when it comes to the grumbling thing. But uh, anyway, we'll come back and look at this. We didn't make that much progress today. But I actually, I kind of like the fact that we got to go back and do a little bit of review because hopefully in your own minds that brings it all into focus, what's been happening as God's plan is progressing through time. And we'll, we'll get back to this and we'll look at Jacob and, and the people of Israel next time. But let's, since we are already at uh, quarter to the hour, let's go ahead and close in prayer. We're going to be on dispensations and ages for a long time, by the way. And not just because of the reviews like this. It's because there's a lot of material to cover here. This is really important for you to understand because you need to understand God's plan and program for the people of Israel, but you also need to understand His plan and program for us today. And we're going to be learning all about that as we go through our study of the dispensations and ages. But let's go ahead and, uh, and wrap up this class by closing in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we Thank you for our, our chance today to do a little bit of a review and to look back at what we've studied so far and bring all of that into focus. And we thank you for the reminder about Abraham's failures, his, his moments in his life where he failed to trust in you, and yet this wonderful example of his faith when he took Isaac up to the mountain to sacrifice him on the altar. And Father, I, I pray that each of us will be reminded that there are moments like that in our lives, moments where we grumble, where we fail to trust in you, where we have our own pity party. Uh, but Father, there's other times where we are able to display great faith, and the only reason we can ever display such wonderful faith is because of who you are and how you're at work in our lives. So Father, we're thankful that we're able to call ourselves your children, and we are your, your children because we have believed in your Son, Jesus Christ, and because of what he has done by being our substitute on the cross, by taking the sins of the world in his body on the cross and bearing the penalty. Because he did that as our substitute on the cross, now by believing in him, we are your children. We have spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. We know that we will spend all of eternity in heaven with you. And Father, with that, with that amazing blessing of knowing that we're going to spend all of eternity with you in heaven and with your son, Jesus Christ, with that should come a motivation to glorify you with everything that we do that should be our response i know sometimes we don't do it father sometimes we fall short and we grumble but we should always be reminded of the wonderful wonderful gift of salvation that we have in jesus christ and because of that we should be motivated and we should be excited about serving you with our lives on a day-by-day -day basis. Father, be at work in our hearts. Continue to mold and shape us. And where we fall short, just etch away, etch away at those areas where we fall short and just get rid of it and help us to be your good and faithful servants, Father. We thank you so much for the things you've taught us today. We thank you in Jesus Christ's most precious and holy name. Amen.